Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. Beefs and rivalries are an undeniable part of the music business and the reggae genre has had more than its own fair share of feuds between rival artists trading lyrical shots at each other over the years. One of the most unreported feuds is that which took place between 1970 and 1971 between Bob Marley and legendary producer Winston Holness aka Niney the Observer. Though there have been countless face-offs between plenty of other musicians, this particular beef was more than any other an encapsulation of the crazy and wild west type of scenario that was the Jamaican music industry in the 1970s. If you really drill down and interrogate the cause of the problem between both guys who were just young men trying to find a breakthrough in life, what you find is a rivalry that didn't truly exist but was a mischievously orchestrated plot by a few reggae producers to settle personal scores by pitting two incredibly young talents against each other. The result was a pretty fierce affair that birthed incredible diss tracks, one of which became among the greatest reggae classics ever recorded, sparked a shipload of music industry politics and degenerated into a physical altercation that ended with Bob Marley's fighting skills, sending Nine the Observer to the hospital to get treatment for wounds sustained in the brutal beatdown outside Bob Marley's record store in Kingston. Let's take a look at the intriguing story behind the heated feud and rivalry that took place between the Tough Gong and Nine the Observer. Now this story begins with Naini in 1967. The young producer had moved to Kingston from his hometown in Montego Bay to try and find a way into the music business. And he would first find work as a studio engineer at KG Records. And his brilliance on the job caught the attention and impressed the great and then itinerant producer Bonnie Stryker Lee. Bonnie Lee was then what you would call a suitcase producer. Simply a producer who didn't own a studio of his own but would ply his trade by paying studio owners for sessions to record their own artists. And this was how he discovered Naini and took him under his wing. The Jamaican music industry had a mafia type structure to it in those times with the big producers like Coxon Dodd and Duke Reed all ruling that landscape like Dons in a quasi partnership understanding. And coming up after them were the likes of Bonnie Lee. And to strengthen his position, like the big bosses above them, Lee began a collaboration with fellow suitcase producers like Lee Scratch Perry and Clancy Eccles. And with Niney being under Bonnie Lee, that unofficial trio had Niney as their trainee producer and errand boy. Niney served that trio for a while, but began to get restless as his bosses were getting richer, but he hadn't made any progress. But an opening and massive opportunity would come in the form of the biggest dawn in the music industry in none other than Clement Coxon Dodd. Dodd had noticed how incredible Niney's productions had turned out and like a true boss, gave that youngster an offer he couldn't refuse. He would offer Niney the chance to use one of his smaller studios on Charles Street in Kingston to produce his own artists and they would split the money 50-50. Of course Niney jumped at the offer and this would infuriate his now former bosses especially Bonnie Lee and Lee Scratch Perry. Lee felt betrayed and I'm very sure really jealous that Coxon Dodd had offered the kid such a sweet deal instead of him. But Lee Scratch Perry's malice was on a different level. Perry had begun his career as an employee at Studio One before falling out with Coxon Dodd and quitting before joining Joe Gibbs Studios and also falling out with that producer acrimoniously over money. And after leaving, Perry would even record diss tracks aimed at his two ex-bosses. And on top of Niney leaving to work with Coxon Dodd, Perry's fury would fly through the roof as Joe Gibbs was also a big fan of Niney and would take Niney on to fill Perry's former role as in-house producer in his studio. And all of this would lead Bonnie Lee and Lee Scratch Perry to declare musical war on Niney by the end of 1969. By 1970, Bonnie Lee and Lee Scratch Perry were making life very difficult for Niney. They had physically intimidated and sabotaged him at every opportunity. But luckily for the young producer, he had the backing of Coxon Dodd and Joe Gibbs and was able to ride whatever storm they threw at him. But the twist was coming. Around that same time, the Whalers, who like Lee Scratch Perry, had left Studio One some years before, went into a collaboration with Lee Scratch Perry for him to produce their music and split whatever profits would come in 50-50. In the early days of that relationship, Bob, Bonnie and Peter loved and believed in Perry and would hang on to his every word. But unfortunately, driven by his still seeding malice against Niney, he would take it upon himself to poison the minds of the Whalers against Niney at every given chance. He would often lie to the Whalers that Niney was copying their melodies to use on the artists that he was producing. This caused Bob in particular to take a very strong dislike to Niney, and this animosity would soon rise to the surface musically. 
After a heated face-off one day in the streets between Bonnie Lee and Lee Scratch Perry on one side, with Naini and Joe Gibbs on the other, Bonnie Lee would exploit Bob's ill feelings towards Naini and took the tough gong into the studio to record a diss track titled Mr. Chatterbox. And this song started with a brief discussion between Bob and Lee talking about the wonderful recording session they had just had, but quickly keep quiet as they see talkative Naini walking by. Naini was aware of the hostility which had been flowing from Bob and his crew, but when Mr. Chatterbox would hit the streets, it finally made him very angry. Now anyone who knows Bonnie Lee's story also knows that this legendary producer was an expert at exploiting trends or controversy to make hit records. He had cashed in on naughty lyrics to produce Max Romeo's smash hit record Wet Dream two years before then and would orchestrate an epic back and forth between I. Roy, Prince Jasbo and Derek Morgan a few years later to great commercial success. Provoked by Chatterbox, Nani would go into his lab and write the incredible song titled Blood and Fire a few days later a track that would become a definitive all-time reggae classic and Rastafarian anthem like no other. It isn't your average diss track in that it named no names, but the lyrics were an ominous apocalyptic type warning with lyrics like, there is no more water to put out the fire, judgment has come and mercy has gone. The odds were completely stacked against Naini at the time because he was broke and down to his last six pounds in the bank. And also, it became hard to get anyone to work with him on that track. He had spoken to Max Romeo to come and help him out with some backup vocals and Max had agreed. But strangely, on the day he was supposed to come and lay his vocals, he never showed up. I can only guess that Max wanted to stay as far away from that beef as possible on account of his close relationship with Bonnie Lee, who let's not forget had produced his massive hit Wet Dream two years before. And also, I'm sure that he wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of Lee Scratch Perry who he was counting on to produce future classics like War in a Babylon a few years later. Naini still managed to assemble his team and would deposit his life savings of £6 for studio time and the result was Blood and Fire which came out just in time for Christmas in 1970. Before the final version hit the streets, a dub cut had been tested in a few public places and one of those places was Bonnie Lee's record store on the popular Orange Street, popularly called Beach Street. And the reaction to that track in the streets was incredible everywhere it was played. It simply drove listeners crazy and this scared the hell out of Bonnie Lee and Lee Scratch Perry and they would use their influence and muscle to keep record stores from selling that record until a very scary intervention from the Bobo Ashanti Rasta family would level the playing field. This particular set of Rastafarians are known for their militant approach and hardcore beliefs. I'm not sure how, but a few copies of the record found their way into the hands of a Bobo Ashanti group in St. Thomas and they became blown away by the fiery and apocalyptic Rastafarian lyrics. And after finding out that the record was being suppressed, they would send out an ominous warning that any record store that refused to sell that record would have them to deal with. And like magic, the song was allowed to circulate and became a monster hit both locally and internationally and was truly what kick-started Naini's amazing career as a producer and an artist. But this amazing breakthrough will stir up more trouble and take the beef between him and Bob Marley to the next level as Lee Scratch Perry's incitement of Bob, Bonnie and Peter would go into overdrive. He once again lied and convinced them that Naini's Blood and Fire has stolen elements of their own song called Love Lights and not long after that, Perry found a way to trick Naini into going for a meeting with the Whalers at Bob Marley's record shop on Chancery Lane knowing fully well that the so-called meeting would lead to a fight. Exactly as Perry had planned it, the meeting quickly descended into a full-blown brawl with Bob and Naini getting into it right there in the streets. Passers-by tried to break up the brawl but Bonnie and Peter warned everybody to allow them fight. That battle would end with Bob coming out on top and Naini injured and going to get his wounds treated at Kingston Public Hospital. But though physically overcome, his record had eclipsed Bob's diss track and he was now fired up to continue the beef. Anticipating a response to Blood and Fire, he would quickly pen another potential killer tune. The response, however, never came because around that time, in early 1971, the Willers found out that Lee Scratch Perry had been playing them big time. And not only was he instigating them against everybody and vice versa, he was ripping them off financially. And they would cut ties with Perry in April after an incident where Bonnie Whaler famously beat up Perry at a restaurant in Kingston. Bob would eventually mend fences with Naini after seeing how badly he'd been played and the pair would enjoy a cordial relationship up until Bob's passing in 1981. Naini on the other hand would go on to become one of Reggae's greatest ever producers. 
This beef between Bob and Naini is a classic example of how treacherous the music industry can truly be. But I'm truly glad that it's all ended with both guys able to recognize the game being played and making peace just in time. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, jobless.